All right, this is CS50. This is week five continued, and we have some good news and some bad news. So, good news is that CS50 lunch is this Friday. If you would like to join us, head to the usual URL here. Even better news no lecture this coming Monday, the 13th. Uh, slightly less better news. Quiz Zero is next Wednesday. More details can be found at this URL here. And over the next couple of days, we'll be filling in the blanks with regard to the rooms that we will have reserved.、Um, better news is that there'll be a course wide review session this coming Monday in the evening. Stay tuned to the course's website for location and details. Sections, even though it is a holiday, will also meet as well.、Um, Best news lecture next Friday. So, this is a tradition we have as per the syllabus.、Um, just, it's going to be amazing.、Uh, you will see things like constant time data structures and hash tables and trees and tries. And we'll talk about、uh, birthday problems. A whole bunch of stuff awaits next Friday. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so recall that we've been focusing on this picture of what's inside of our computer's memory. So, memory or RAM is where programs exist while you're running them. If you double click an icon to run some program or double click an icon to open some file, it's loaded from your hard drive or solid state drive into RAM, random access memory, where it lives until the power goes off, the laptop lid closes, or you quit the program. Now, that memory, of which you probably have a gigabyte these days, two gigabytes, or even much more, is generally laid out for a given program in this sort of rectangular conceptual model, whereby we have the stack at the bottom and a bunch of other stuff at the top. The thing at the very top, We've seen on this picture before, but never talked about it, is the so called text segment. Text segment is just a fancy way of saying the zeros and ones that compose your actual compiled program. So, when you double click Microsoft Word on your Mac or PC, or when you run dot slash Mario on a Linux computer at your terminal window, the zeros and ones that compose Word or Mario are stored temporarily in your computer's RAM in the so called text segment. For a particular program. Below that goes initialized and uninitialized data. This is stuff like global variables that we've not used many of, but on occasion we've had global variables or statically defined strings, that is, hard coded words like hello that aren't taken in from the user that are hard coded into your program. Now, down at the bottom, we have the so called stack. And the stack thus far we've been using for what kinds of purposes? What's the stack been used for? Yeah. For functions? In what sense for functions? Exactly. When you call a function, its arguments are copied onto the stack. So any x's or y's or a's or b's that you're passing into a function are temporarily put on the so called stack, just like one of the Annenberg dining hall trays. And also things like local variables. If your foo function or your swap function have local variables like temp, those two end up on the stack. Now, we won't talk too much about them, but these environment variables at the bottom, we saw a while ago when I was futzing at the keyboard one day and I started accessing things like argv100. Or argv a thousand, just elements, I forget the numbers, but that weren't supposed to be accessed by me. We started seeing some funky symbols on the screen. Those were so called environment variables, like global settings for my program or for my computer, not unrelated to the recent bug that we discussed、um, that has been shell shock that's been plaguing quite a few computers. Now, lastly, in today's focus, we'll ultimately be on the heap. This is another chunk of memory. And fundamentally, all this memory is the same stuff. It's the same hardware. We're just sort of treating different clusters of bytes for different purposes. The heap is also going to be where variables and memory that you request from the operating system is temporarily stored. But there's kind of a problem here, as the picture implies. We sort of have two ships about to collide because as you use more and more of the stack, and as we see today onward, as you use more and more of the heap, surely. Bad things might happen. And indeed, we can induce that intentionally or unintentionally. So, the cliffhanger last time was this program, which didn't serve any functional purpose other than to demonstrate how you, as a bad guy, can actually take advantage of bugs in someone's program and take over a program or even a whole computer system or server. So, just to glance briefly, notice that main at the bottom takes in command line arguments, as per argv, and it has a call to a function f. Essentially, nameless function called f, and it's passing in argv1. So, whatever word the user types in at the prompt after this program's name. And then this arbitrary function up top, f, takes in a string, aka char star, as we've begun to discuss, and it just calls it bar, but we could call it anything. And then it declares inside of f an array of characters called c, 12 such characters. Now, by the story I was telling a moment ago, where in memory is c, or are those 12 chars going to end up? Just to be clear. Yeah. 
on the stack. So C is a local variable. We're asking for 10 chars or 10,、uh, 12 chars or 12 bytes. Those are going to end up on the so called stack. Now, finally, is this other function that's actually pretty useful, but we've not really used it ourselves str n copy. It means string copy. But only n letters, n characters. So n characters will be copied、uh, from bar into C. And how many? The length of bar. So, in other words, that one line, str n copy, is going to copy effectively bar into C. Now, just to kind of anticipate the moral of this story, what is potentially problematic here? Even though we're checking the length of bar and passing it into str n copy, what is your gut telling you is still? Broken about this program. Yeah. Doesn't include room for the null character, potentially. Unlike in past practice, we don't even have so much as a plus one to accommodate that null character, but it's even worse than that. What else are we failing to do? Yeah. Perfect. We've hard coded 12 pretty arbitrarily. But the pro- that isn't so much the problem, but the fact that we're not even checking if the length of bar is less than 12, in which case it's going to be safe to put it into the memory called C that we've allocated. Indeed, if bar is like 20 characters long, this function appears to be copying 20 characters from bar into C. Thereby taking at least eight bytes that it shouldn't be. That's the implication here. So, in short, broken program. Not such a big deal. Maybe you get a segmentation fault. We've all had bugs in programs. We all might have pro- bugs in programs right now. But what's the implication? Well, here's a zoomed in version of that picture of my computer's memory. This is the bottom of my stack. And indeed, at the very bottom is what's called parent routine stack. Fancy way of saying that's main. So, that's whoever called. The function f that we're talking about. So, this is the bottom of the stack. Return address is something new. It's always been there. It's always been in that picture. We've just never called attention to it because it turns out the way C works is that when one function calls another, not only do the arguments to that function get pushed onto the stack, not only do the function's local variables get pushed onto the stack, something called a return address also gets put onto the stack. Specifically, if main calls foo, main's Own address in memory, ox something, effectively gets put onto the stack so that when f is done executing, it knows where to jump back to in the text segment in order to continue executing.、Right? So if we're here conceptually in main, then f gets called. How does f know who to hand control back? Well, this little breadcrumb in red here called the return address, it just checks what is that return address? Oh, let me jump back to main here. And that's a little bit of an oversimplification because the zeros and ones for main are technically up here in the text segment. But that's the idea. F just has to know to where control ultimately goes back. But the way computers have long laid out things like local variables and arguments is like this. So in the top of this picture in blue is the stack frame for F. So all of the memory that F specifically is using. So accordingly, Notice that bar is in this picture. Bar was its argument, and we claim that all arguments to functions get pushed onto the stack. And C, of course, is also in this picture. And just for notational purposes, notice that the top left hand corner is what would be C bracket 0, and then slightly down to the right is C bracket 11. So, in other words, you can imagine that there's a grid of, pick, of、uh, bytes there, first of which is top left, bottom of which uh, is, uh, is the last of those 12 bytes. But now try to fast forward. What is about to happen if we pass in a string bar that's longer than C and we're not checking if it's indeed longer than 12? Which part of this picture is going to get overwritten by bytes 0, 1, 2, 3, dot, 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 11, and then bad, 12, 13 through 19? What's going to happen here? If you infer from the ordering that C bracket 0 is on the top and C bracket 11 is sort of down to the right. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like you're going to overwrite char star bar. And worse, if you send in a really long string, you might even overwrite what? The return address, which again is just like a breadcrumb to tell the program where to go back to when f is done being called. So, what bad guys typically do is if they come across a program that they're curious whether it is exploitable, buggy, in such a way that he or she can take advantage of that bug, generally they don't get this right the first time. They just start sending, for instance, random strings into your program, whether at the keyboard or frankly, they probably write a little program to just automatically generate strings and start banging on your program by sending it lots of different inputs of different lengths. As soon as your program crashes, 
crashes, that's an amazing thing because it means he or she has discovered what is probably indeed a bug. And then they can get more clever and start focusing more narrowly on how to exploit that bug. In particular, what he or she might do is send, in the best case, hello, no big deal. That's a string that's sufficiently short. But what if he or she sends, and we'll generalize it as attack code? So, zeros and ones that do things like rm rf, that remove everything from the hard drive, or send spam, or somehow attack the machine. So, if each of these letters A just represents conceptually attack, 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 some bad code that someone else wrote, but if that person is smart enough to not only include all of those rm rfs, but also have his or her last few bytes be a number that corresponds to. The address of his or her own attack code that he or she passed in just by providing it at the prompt, you can effectively trick the computer into noticing when F is done executing, oh, it's time for me to jump back to the red return address. But because he or she has somehow overlapped that return address with their own number, and they're smart enough to have configured that number to refer, as you see in the super top left hand corner there, the actual address in the computer's memory of some of their attack code. A bad guy can trick the computer into executing his or her own code. And that code, again, can be anything. It's generally called shell code, which is just a way of saying that it's not generally something as simple as RMRF. It's actually something like bash or an actual program that gives him or her programmatic control to execute anything else that they want to. So, in short, this all derives from the simple fact that this bug involved not checking the boundaries of your array. And because the way computers work is that they use the stack from effectively, conceptually, bottom on up, but then the elements you push onto the stack grow top down, this is incredibly problematic. Now, there are ways to work around this, and frankly, there are languages with which to work around this. Java is immune, for instance, to this particular issue because they don't give you pointers, they don't give you direct memory addresses. So, with this power that we have to touch anything in memory we want, comes admittedly great risk. So, keep an eye out. And frankly, in the months or years to come, anytime you read about some exploitation of a program or a server, if you ever see a hint of something like a buffer overflow attack, Um, or stack overflow is another type of attack, similar in spirit, much、uh, as inspires the website's name, if you know it. It's all talking about just overflowing the size of some character array or some array more generally. Any questions then on this? Don't try this at home. All right. So, malloc thus far has been our new friend in that we can allocate memory that we don't necessarily know in advance that we want. So, we don't have to hard code into our program numbers like 12. Once the user tells us how much data he or she wants to input, we can malloc that much memory. So, malloc, it turns out, for, to the extent we've been using it explicitly last time, and then you guys have been using it for get string unknowingly for several weeks, all of malloc's memory comes from the so called heap. And this is why get string, for instance, Can allocate memory dynamically without knowing what you're going to type in advance, hand you back a pointer to that memory, and that memory is still yours to keep even after get string returns. Because recall, after all, that the stack is constantly going up and down, up and down. And as soon as it goes down, that means any memory this function used should not be used by anyone else. It's garbage values now. But the heap is up here. And what's nice about malloc is that when malloc allocates memory up here, it's not impacted for the most part by the stack. And so any functions can access memory that has been mallocked, even by a function like getString, even after it is returned. Now, the converse of malloc is free. And indeed, the rule you need to start adopting is any, any, any time you use malloc, you must yourself use free eventually on that same pointer. Now, all this time, we have been writing buggy, buggy code for many reasons, but one of which has been using the CS50 library, which itself is deliberately buggy. It leaks memory. Anytime you've called getString over the past few weeks, we're asking the operating system, Linux, for memory, and you have never once given it back. And this is not in practice a good thing. And Valgrind, one of the tools introduced in PSET 4, is all about helping you now find bugs like that. But thankfully for PSET 4, you don't need to use the CS50 library or getString, so any bugs related to memory are ultimately going to be your own. So, malloc is more than just convenient for this purpose. We can actually now solve fundamentally different. Problems and, funda- and fundamentally solve problems more effectively as per week zero's promise. Thus far, this is the sexiest data structure we've had. And by data structure, I just mean a way of conceptualizing memory in a way that goes beyond just saying this is an int, this is a char. We can start to cluster things together. 
So an array looked like this. And what was key in about an array is that it gives you back to back chunks of memory, each of which is going to be of the same type int, 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 or char, 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 char. But there's a few downsides. This, for instance, is an array of size 6. Suppose you fill this array with six numbers, and then for whatever reasons, your user wants to give you a seventh number. Where do you put it? What's the solution if you have created an array on the stack, for instance, just with the week two notation that we introduced of square brackets with a number inside? Well, you've got six numbers in these boxes. What would your instincts be? Where would you want to put it? Sorry? Put it on the end. So just over to the right outside of this box, which would be nice, but it turns out you can't do that because if you've not asked for this chunk of memory, it could be by coincidence that this is being used by some other variable altogether. Think back a week or so when we laid out Zamila and Davin and Gabe's names in memory. They were literally back to back to back. So we can't necessarily trust that whatever's over here is available for me to use. So, what else might you do? Well, once realizing you need an,、uh, an array of size 7, you could just create an array of size 7, then use a for loop or a while loop, copy it into the new array, and then somehow just get rid of this array or just stop using it. But that's not particularly efficient. In short, arrays don't let you dynamically resize. So, on the one hand, you get random access, which is amazing because it lets us do things like divide and conquer, binary search, all of which we've talked about on the screen here. But you paint yourself into a corner. As soon as you know, hit the end of your array, you have to do a very expensive operation or write a whole bunch of code to now deal with that problem. So, what if instead we had something called a list or a linked list in particular? What if instead of having rectangles back to back to back, we have rectangles that leave a little bit of wiggle room in between them? And even though I've drawn this picture or ad、uh, adapted this picture from one of the texts here, To be back to back to back very orderly, in reality, one of those rectangles could be up here in memory. One of them could be up here. One of them could be up here, over here, and so forth. But what if we drew, in this case, arrows that somehow link these rectangles together? Indeed, we've seen a technical incarnation of an arrow. How, what, has you, what have we used in recent days that underneath the hood is representative of an arrow? So a pointer. Right? So, what if instead of just storing the numbers like 9, 17, 22, 26, 34, 24, what if we stored not only a number, but a pointer next to each such number? So that much like you would thread a needle through a whole bunch of fabric, somehow tying things together, similarly, can we with pointers, as incarnated by arrows here, kind of weave together these individual rectangles by effectively using a pointer next to each number that points to? Some next number that points to in turn some next number. So, in other words, what if we actually wanted to implement something like this? Well, unfortunately, these rectangles, at least the one with 9, 17, 22, and so forth, these are no longer nice squares with single numbers. The bottom rectangle below 9, for instance, represents what should be a pointer, 32 bits. Now, I'm not yet aware of any data type in C that gives you not only an int, but a pointer altogether. So, what's the solution if we want to invent our own answer to this? Yeah. What's that? Yeah, so why don't we create a new structure or in C, a struct? We've seen structs before, if briefly, where we dealt with a student, ob a student structure like this who had a name and a house. In P set 3 breakout, you used a whole bunch of structs, G rect and G ovals that Stanford created to cluster information together. So, what if we take this same idea of the keywords typedef and struct and then some student specific stuff? And evolve this into the following typedef struct node, and node is just a very generic computer science term for something in a data structure, a container in a data structure. A node, I claim, is going to have an int n, totally straightforward, and then a little more cryptically, this second line, struct node star next. But in less technical terms, what is that second line of code inside the curly braces? Yeah. A pointer to another node. So, admittedly, syntax a little cryptic. But if you read it literally, next is the name of a variable. What is its data type? It's a little verbose this time, but it's of type struct node star. Anytime we've seen something star, that means it's a pointer to that data type. So next is apparently a pointer to a struct node. Now, what is a struct node? Well, notice you see those same words at top right. And indeed, you also see the word node down here at bottom left. And this is actually just a convenience. Notice that in our student definition, there's the word student only once. 
And that's because a student object was not self referential. There's nothing inside of a student that needs to point to another student, per se. That would be sort of weird in the real world. But with a node in a linked list, we do want a node to be referential to a similar object. And so notice the change here is not just what's inside the curly braces, but we add the word node at the top. As well as adding it to the bottom in lieu of students. And this is only a technical detail so that, again, your data structure can be self referential, so that a node can point to another such node. So, what is this ultimately going to mean for us? Well, one, this stuff inside is the contents of our node. This thing up here, top right, is just so that, again, we can refer to ourselves. And then the outermost stuff, even though node is a new term perhaps, it's still the same as student and what was underneath the hood in SPL. So, if we now wanted to start implementing this linked list, how might we translate something like this to code? Well, let's just see an example of a program that actually uses a linked list. Among today's distribution code is a program called List Zero. And if I run this, I created a super simple GUI, graphical user interface, but it's really just printf. And now I've given myself a few menu options delete, insert, traverse,、uh, search, and traverse, and quit. These are just common operations on a data structure known as a linked list. Now, delete. Is going to delete a number from the list. Insert is going to add a number to the list. Search is going to look for a number in the list. And traverse is just a fancy way of saying walk through the list, printing it out, but that's it. Don't change it in any way. So let's try this. Let's go ahead and type 2. And then I'm going to insert the number, say, 9. Enter. And now my program is just programmed to say list is now 9. Now if I go ahead and do insert again, let me go ahead and zoom out and type in 17. Now, my list is 9, then 17. If I do insert again, let's skip one. Instead of 22, as per the picture we've been looking at here, let me jump ahead and insert 26 next. So I'm going to type 26. The list is as I expect. But now, just to see if this code is going to be flexible, let me now type 22, which, at least conceptually, if we're keeping this sorted, which is indeed going to be another goal right now, should go in between 17 and 26. So I hit Enter. Indeed, that works. And so now let me insert the last per the picture, 34. All right. So for now, let me stipulate that delete and traverse and search do in fact work. In fact, if I do run search, let's search for the number 22, enter, it found 22. So that is what this program list zero does. But what is actually going on that implements this? Well, first, I might have, and indeed I do have, a file called list zero. Dot h, and somewhere in there is this line type def struct node. Then I have my curly braces, int n, and then struct, what was the definition? Struct node next. So we need the star. Now, technically, we get into the habit of drawing it here. You might see textbooks and online references do it there. It's functionally equivalent. In fact, this is a little more typical, but I'll be consistent with what we did last time and do this. And then lastly, I'm going to do this. So in a header file somewhere, In list0.h today is this struct definition and maybe some other stuff. Meanwhile, in list0c, there's going to be a few things, but we're going to just start and not finish this. List0.h is a file I want to include in my C file. And then at some point, I'm going to have int main void. And then I'm going to have some to dos here. I'm also going to have a prototype like void search int n. Whose purpose in life is to search for an element. And then down here, I claim in today's code void search int n, no semicolon, but open curly braces. And now I want to somehow search for an element in this list. But we don't have enough information on the screen yet. I haven't actually represented the list itself. So one way we could implement a linked list in a program is I kind of want to do something like. You know, declare linked list up here. For simplicity, I'm going to make this global, even though in general we shouldn't do this too much, but it'll simplify this example. So I want to declare a linked list up here. Now, how might I do that? Here's the picture of a linked list, and I don't really know at the moment how I'm going to go about representing so many things with just one variable in memory. But think back a moment. All this time we've had strings, which we then revealed to be arrays of characters, which we then revealed to just be a pointer to the first character in an array of characters that's null terminated. So, by that logic and with this picture kind of seeding your thoughts, what need we actually write in our code to represent a linked list? How much of this information do we need to capture in C code, would you say? Yeah. A pointer to a node. In particular, which node would your instincts be to keep a pointer to? 
Yeah, probably just the first. And notice the first node is a different shape. It's only half the size of the structs because it's indeed only a pointer. So, what you can indeed do is declare a linked list and as to be of type node star, and let's just call it first and initialize it to null. So, null again is coming into the picture here. Not only is null used as like a special a return value for things like get string and malloc, null is also the zero pointer, the lack of a pointer, if you will. It just means nothing is yet here. Now, first, I could have called this anything. I could have called it list or any number of other things, but I'm calling it first just so that it lines up with this picture. So, just like a string can be represented with the address of its first byte, so can a linked list. And we'll see other data structures be represented with just one pointer, a 32 bit arrow. Pointing at the very first node in the structure. But now let's anticipate a problem. If I'm only remembering in my program the address of the first node, the first rectangle in this data structure, what has better be the case about the implementation of the rest of my list? What's a key detail that's going to make ensure this actually works? And by actually works, I mean much like a string lets us go from the first character in Davin's name to the second, to the third, to the fourth, to the, the very end. How do we know when we're at the end of a linked list that looks like this? When it's null. And I've represented this sort of as like an electrical engineer might with a little、um, grounding symbol of sorts, but that just means null in this case. You could draw it any number of ways, but this author happened to use this symbol here. So, so long as we're stringing all of these nodes together, only remembering where the first one is, so long as we put a special symbol at the very last node in the list, and we'll use null. Because that's what we have available to us, this list is complete. And even if I only give you a pointer to the first element, you, the programmer, can certainly access the rest of it. But let's let your minds wander a little bit, if they're not already quite wandered. What's going to be the running time of finding anything in this list? Damn it, it's big O of n, which isn't bad in fairness, but it is linear. We have given up what feature of arrays by moving more toward this picture of dynamically woven together or linked. Nodes. We've given up random access, right? An array is nice because mathematically everything is back to back to back to back. Even though this picture looks pretty, and even though it looks like these nodes are nicely spaced apart, in reality they could be anywhere. OX1, OX50, OX123, OX99. These nodes could be anywhere because malloc does allocate memory from the heap, but anywhere in the heap. You don't necessarily know that it's going to be back to back to back. And so this picture, in reality, is not going to be quite this pretty. So, it's going to take a bit of work to implement this function. So, let's implement search now, and we'll see kind of a clever way of doing this. So, if I am a search function and I'm given a variable,、uh, an integer n to look for, I need to know the new syntax for looking inside of a structure that's a point, pointed to to find n. So, let's do this. So, first, I'm going to go ahead and declare a node star, and I'm going to call it pointer just by convention, and I'm going to initialize it to first. And now I can do this in a number of ways, but I'm going to take a common approach. While pointer is not equal to null, and that's valid syntax, and it just means do the following so long as you're not pointing at nothing, what do I want to do? If pointer.n, let me come back to that, equals equals what? What value am I looking for? The actual n that was passed in. So here's another feature of C in many languages, even though the structure. Called node has a value n, totally legitimate to also have a local argument or a variable called n, because even we, as with human eyes, can distinguish that this n is presumably different from this n, because the syntax is different. You've got a dot and the pointer, whereas one has no such thing. So this is okay. That's okay to call them the same things. If I do find this, I'm going to want to do something like announce that we found n, and we'll leave that as a comment or pseudocode. Else, and here's the interesting part. What do I want to do if the current node is not containing n that I care about? How do I achieve the following? If my finger at the moment is PTR and it's pointing at whatever first is pointing at, how do I move my finger to the next node in code? Well, what's the breadcrumb we're going to follow in this case? Yeah, so next. Next. So if I go back to my code here, indeed, I'm going to go ahead and say pointer, which is just a temporary variable. It's a weird name, PTR, but it's just like temp. I'm going to set pointer equal to whatever pointer is. And again, this is going to be a little buggy for a moment, dot next. In other words, I'm going to take the, my finger that's pointing at this node here, and I'm going to say, you know what? Take a look 
at the next field and move your finger to whatever it's pointing at. And this is going to repeat, repeat, repeat. But when does my finger stop doing anything at all? As soon as which, what line of code kicks in? If point, while pointer is not equal to null. At some point, my finger is going to be pointing at null, and I'm going to realize that's the end of this list. Now, this is a little white lie for simplicity. It turns out that even though we just learned this dot notation for structures, pointer is not a struct. PTR is what? Just to be more nitpicky, it's a pointer to a node. It's not a node itself. If I had no star here, pointer, absolutely, it's a node. This is like week one declaration of a variable, even though the word node is new. But as soon as we introduce a star, it's now a pointer to a node. And unfortunately, you can't use the dot notation for a pointer. You have to use the arrow notation, which strikingly is the first time any piece of syntax looks intuitive, right? This is literally looks like an arrow. And so that's a good thing. And down here, literally looks like an arrow. So I think that's the last, I don't think I'm overcommitting here. I think that's the last new piece of syntax we're going to see. And thankfully, it's indeed a little more intuitive. Now, for those of you who might prefer the old way, you can still use the dot notation. But as per Monday's conversation, we first need to go there, go to that address, and then access the field. So this is also correct. And frankly, this is a little more pedantic. You're literally saying dereference the pointer and go there. Then grab dot n, the field called n. But frankly, no one wants to type or read this. And so the world invented the arrow notation, which is equivalent, identical. It's just syntactic sugar, so a fancy way of saying this looks better or looks simpler. So now I'm going to do one other thing. I'm going to say break once I found it so I don't keep looking for it. But this is the gist of a search function. But it's a lot easier. Um, in the end, not to walk through the code. This is indeed the formal implementation of search in today's distribution code.、Um, I dare say that、uh, insert is not particularly fun to walk through in, in,、uh, visually, nor is delete, even though at the end of the day they boil down to fairly simple heuristics. So let's do this. If, you, if you'll humor me here, I did bring a bunch of stress balls, I brought a bunch of numbers, and could we get just a few volunteers to represent 9, 17, 20, 22, 29, 9, and 34, so essentially, like everyone who's here today. All right, so、uh, that was one, two, three, four, five, six people. And I've been asked to go as. See, no one in the back raises their hands. OK, one, two, three, four, five. Let me load balance. Six. OK, you six, come on up. We'll need other people. We brought extra stress balls. And if you could, for just a moment, line yourselves up just like this picture here. All right,、uh, let's see. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew, you are number nine. Nice to meet you. Here you go. <laughs> I, Jen. Jen, D- David, number 17. Yes? I'm Julia. Julia, David, number 20. Christian. Christian, David, number 22. And JP. JP, number 29. So go ahead and get、oh, in. Uh oh. Uh oh. Stand by.、Uh, 20. Does anyone have a marker? <laughs> You got a Sharpie? OK. a y And does anyone have a piece of paper? <laughs> Save the lecture. Come on.、Uh, we got it? All right, thank you. You just, here we go. Oh,、uh, was this from you? You just saved the day. All right. So, 29. All right. I, I misspelled 29, but OK, a y go ahead. <laughs> All right. I'll give you your pen back momentarily. So we have these folks here. Let's have one other. If Gabe, do you want to play number,、uh, the first element here? We'll need you to point at these fine folks. So 9, 17, 20, 22, <laughs> sort of 29, and then 34. Oh, did I lose? Did we lose someone? I do have a 34. Where did, no, we do. OK, a y who wants to be 34? OK, a y come on up, 34. All right. This will be well worth the climax. What's your name? Peter. Peter, come on up. All right, so here's a whole bunch of nodes. Each of you guys represents one of these rectangles, and Gabe, the slightly odd man out, represents first. So his pointer is a little smaller on the screen than everyone else. And in this case, each of your left hands is going to either point down, thereby representing null, so just the absence of a pointer, or it's going to be pointing at a node next to you. So right now, if you adorn yourselves like the picture here, go ahead and point at each other, with Gabe in particular pointing at number nine to represent the list. OK, and number 34, your left hand should just be pointing at the floor. OK, so this is the linked list. So this is the scenario in question. Indeed, this is representative of a class of problems that you might try to solve with code. You want to ultimately insert a new element into the list. In this case, we're going to try inserting the number 55. 
But there's going to be different cases to consider. And indeed, this is going to be one of the big picture takeaways here is what are the different cases? What are the different if conditions or branches that your program might have? Well, the number you're trying to insert, which we know now to be 55, but if you didn't know in advance, I dare say falls into at least three possible situations. Where might a new element be? At the end, in the middle, or at the beginning. So I claim there's at least three problems we need to solve. Let's choose what's perhaps arguably the simplest one, where the new element belongs at the beginning. So I'm going to have code quite like search, which I just wrote, and I'm going to have PTR, which I'll represent here with my finger as usual. And remember, what ver- value did we initialize PTR to? So we initialized it to null initially, but then what did we do once we were inside our search function? We set it equal to first, which doesn't mean doing this, right? If I set PTR equal to first, what should my hand really be pointing at? Right. So if Gabe and I are going to be equal values here, we need to both point at number nine. So this was the beginning of our story. And now this is just straightforward. Even though the syntax is new, conceptually, this is just linear search. Is 55 equal to nine? Or rather,、uh, let's say less than nine, because I'm trying to figure out where to put 55. Less than nine, less than 17, less than 20, less than 22, less than 29, less than 34, no. So now we are in case one of at least three. If I want to insert 55 over here, what lines of code need to get executed? How does this picture of humans need to change? What do I do with my left hand? This should be null initially, because I'm at the end of the list. And what should happen here with Peter, was it? He's obviously going to point to me. So, I claim there's at least two lines of code in the sample code from today that's going to implement this scenario of adding 55 at the tail. And could I have someone hop up and just represent 55? All right, you are the new 55. All right, so now what if the next scenario comes along and we want to insert at the beginning or the head of this list? And what's your name, number 55? Jack. Jack? Okay, nice. Welcome, nice to meet you. Welcome aboard. So, now we're going to insert, say, the number five. Here's the second case of the three we came up with before. So if five belongs at the beginning, let's see how we find that out. I initialize my PTR pointer to number nine again, and I realize, oh, five is less than nine. So fix this picture for us. Whose hands, Gabe's or David's or not, what's, num- what's number nine's name? Jen. Jen's hands, which of our hands need to change? OK, so Gabe points at what now? At me. I am the new node. So I'll just kind of move here to see it visually. And meanwhile, what do I point at? Still, where I'm pointing. So that's it. So, just really one line of code fixes this particular issue, it would seem. All right, so that's good. And can someone be a placeholder for nine?、Oh, five? Oh,、uh, five? Come on up. All right. We'll get you next time. All right, so now, and as an aside, the names I'm not making explicit mention of right now pred pointer, predecessor pointer, and new pointer that's just、uh, the names given in the sample code to the pointers or my hands that's kind of pointing around. What's your name? Christine. All right, welcome aboard. All right, so let's consider now a slightly more annoying scenario whereby I want to insert something like 26 into this. 20? What? All right, these are. Good thing we have this pen. All right, 20. If someone could get another piece of paper ready just in case. All right. Oh, interesting. Well, this is, this is an example of a lecture bug. OK, a y so what's your name again? Julia, can you pop out and pretend you were never there? OK. a y This never happened. Thank you. So, suppose we want to insert Julia into this linked list. She is the number 20. And of course, she's going to belong at the beginning.、Uh, don't point at anything yet. So, your hand can kind of be down, null, or some garbage value. Let's tell the quick, quick story. I'm pointing at number five this time. Then I check nine. Then I check 17. Then I check 22. And I realize, ooh,、uh, Julia needs to go before 22. So, what needs to happen? Whose hands need to change? Julia's, mine, or what's your name again? Christian.、Oh, Christian or? Andy. Andy. Christian or Andy? All right, Andy needs to point at Julia. All right, so Andy, you want to point at Julia? But wait a minute. In this story thus far, I'm the sort of one in charge in the sense that pointer. Is the thing that's moving through the list. We might have a name for Andy, but there's no variable called Andy, right? The only other variable we have is first, who's represented by Gabe. So this is actually why, thus far, we've not needed this, but now on the screen, there is mention again of pred pointer. So let me be more explicit. If this is pointer, I had better get a little more intelligent about my iteration, if you don't mind my going through here again, pointing here. Pointing here, but you know what? Let me have a pred pointer, a predecessor pointer that's kind of pointing at the element I was just at. 
So when I go here, now my left hand updates. When I go here, my left hand updates. And now I have not only a pointer to the element that goes after Julia, I still have a pointer to Andy, the element before. So you have access, essentially, breadcrumbs, if you will, to all of the requisite pointers. So if I'm pointing at Andy and I'm also pointing at Christian, whose hands should now be pointed elsewhere? So Andy can now point at Julia. Julia can now point at Christian because you, she can copy my right hand's pointer, and that effectively puts you back into this place here. So, in short, even though this is taking us kind of forever to actually update a linked list, realize that the operations are relatively simple, right? It's a one, two, three lines of code ultimately, but wrapped around those lines of code, presumably, is a bit of logic that effectively asks the question where are we? Are we at the beginning, the middle, or the end? Now, there are certainly some other operations we might implement, and these pictures here just depict what we just did with humans. What about removal? If I want to, for instance, remove the number 34 or 55, I might have the same kind of code, but I'm going to need one or two steps because what's new? If I remove someone at the end, like number 55 and then 34, what also has to change as I do that? I have to not only evict, what's your name again? Jack. Jack. I have to not only evict free Jack, so literally call free Jack, or at least the pointer there too, but now what needs to change with Peter? His hand better start pointing down, because as soon as I call free on Jack, if Peter's still pointing at Jack and I therefore keep traversing the list and access this pointer, that's when our old friend segmentation fault might actually kick in, because we've given the memory back to Jack.、Um, you can stay there awkwardly for just a moment. Because we have just a couple final operations to consider. Removing the head of the list or the beginning. And this one's a little annoying because we have to know that Gabe is kind of special in this program because indeed he has his own pointer. He's not just being pointed at, as is almost everyone else here. So when the head of the list is removed, whose hands need to change now? What's your name again?、Christine. I'm awful at names apparently. So Christine and、uh, Gabe, whose hands need to change when we try to remove Christine, number five from the picture? Okay, so let's do Gabe. Gabe's going to point presumably at number nine. But what next should happen? Okay, we should probably make some. I heard null somewhere. What? Null what? Null and free her. So this is very easy, and it's perfect that you're now sort of standing there,、um, not belonging, because you've been decoupled from the list. You've effectively been orphaned from the list. And so we had better call free now on Christine to give that memory back. Otherwise, every time we delete a node from the list, we might be making、uh, the list shorter, but not actually decreasing the size in memory. And so if we keep adding and adding and adding things to the list, my computer might get slower and slower and slower because I'm running out of memory, even if I'm not actually using Christine's bytes of memory anymore. So, in the end, there are other scenarios, of course, removal in the middle, removal at the end, as we saw. But the more interesting challenge now is going to be to consider exactly what the running time is. So, not only can you keep your pieces of paper, if Gabe, you wouldn't mind giving everyone a stress ball, thank you so much to our linked list of volunteers here. If you could. <laughs> All right. So, a couple of analytical questions then. If I could, we've seen this notation before. Thank you. Thank you. We've seen this notation before big O and omega, upper bounds and lower bounds on the running time of some algorithm. So let's consider just a couple of questions. One, and we said it before, what's the running time of search for a list in terms of big O? What's an upper bound on the running time of searching a linked list as implemented by our volunteers here? It's big O of n, linear. Because in the worst case, The element, like 55, we might be looking for might be where Jack was all the way at the end. And unfortunately, unlike an array, we can't get fancy this time. Even though all of our humans were sorted from small elements 5 to all the way up to the bigger element 55, that's usually a good thing. But what does that assumption no longer allow us to do? Say again? Random access. And in turn, that means we can no longer use weak zeros, intuition, and obviousness of using binary search and divide and conquer. Because even though we humans could obviously see that Andy or Christian were roughly in the middle of the list, we only know that as a computer by skimming the list from the very beginning. So we've given up that random access. So big O of n now is the upper bound on our search time. What about omega of our search? What's the lower bound on searching for some number in this list? Say again? One. So, constant time, right? In the best case, Christine is indeed at the beginning of the list, and we're looking for number five, so we found her. So, no big deal, but she's got to be at the beginning of the list in this case. What about something like delete? 
What if you want to delete an element? What's the upper bound and lower bound on deleting something from a linked list? Say again? N is indeed the upper bound, because in the worst case, we try to delete Jack like we just did. He's all the way at the end, takes us forever, or N steps to find him. So that's an upper bound that's linear. Sure. In the best case, running time, or the lower bound, in the best case would be constant time, because maybe we try to delete Christine and we just get lucky. She's at the beginning. Now, wait a minute. Gabe was also at the beginning, and we also had to update Gabe. So that wasn't just one step. So is it indeed constant time in the best case to remove the smallest element? It is, even though it might be two, three, or even 100 lines of code, if it's the same number of lines, not in some loop, and independent of the size of the list, absolutely. Deleting the element at the beginning of the list, even if we have to deal with Gabe, is still constant time. So this seems like a massive step backwards. And what a waste of time if in week one and week zero, we had not only pseudocode, but actual code to implement something that's log base n, or log rather of n base 2. In terms of its running time. So, why the heck would we want to start using something like a linked list? Yeah. So, you can add elements to the array. And this too is thematic, and we'll continue to see this. This trade off, much like we've seen a trade off with merge sort, we could really speed up search. Or sorting, rather, if we spend a bit more space and have an additional chunk of our memory or an array for merge sort, but we spend more space, but we save time. In this case, we're giving up time, but we're gaining flexibility, dy dynamism, if you will, which is arguably a positive feature. We're also spending space. In what sense is a linked list more expensive in terms of space than an array? Where is the extra space coming from? Yeah? Yeah, we also have the pointer. So this is minorly annoying in that no longer am I storing just an int to represent an int. I'm storing an int and a pointer, which is also 32 bits. So I'm literally doubling the amount of space involved. So that's a trade off, but that's in the case of int. Suppose that you're not storing int, but suppose each of these rectangles, each of these humans was representing a word, an English word. That might be five characters, 10 characters, maybe even more. Then adding just 32 more bits might be less of a big deal. What if each of the students in the demonstration were literally student structs that have names and houses and maybe phone numbers and Twitter handles and the like? So, all of the fields we started talking about the other day, much less of a big deal as our nodes get more interesting and big to spend、ah, an additional pointer just to link them together. But indeed, it's a trade off. And indeed, the code is more complex, as you'll see by skimming through that particular example. But what if there were some holy grail here? What if we don't take a step backwards, but a massive step forward and implement a data structure via which we can find elements like Jack or Christine or any other elements in this array in true constant time? Search is constant. Delete is constant. Insert is constant. All of these operations are constant. That would be our holy grail. And that is where we will pick up next time. See you then. And now, Deep Thoughts by Davin Farnham. Memories like jumping into a pile of golden leaves on a Sunday afternoon, wind blowing, tossing your hair. Oh, I miss the days when. <laughs>